in our, our panels here. Yeah, so two of them are with us uh, in person and two of them are online. So uh, in person we have uh, Dr. Uh, Fidelis Yambi Mwazi, the Chief Executive Officer of Namibia Economic Board. So Dr. Mwazi is a well-seasoned uh, researcher, GIS and processing expert, and a crop scientist with over 20 years of work experience in the agronomic and horticulture industry, as well as an, uh, an academic uh, in the in, in research. What are we doing in terms of marketing in Namibia internationally and globally? I think that's the video we have been using in the last six months to market Namibia. But just in short, we thought, I think, just to give the perspectives of, of the trend of uh, different statistical information in terms of our products that we are producing and marketing and where are the opportunities available. Uh, this is just to give you a bit of in a nutshell about uh, how we are approaching activities. Uh, just trying to fix this. How, how we, are, we are approaching activities within the Namibian economy for that. This is just our strategic plan. With our vision, we are not a profit driven as a government institution that is responsible to regulate and promote the economic and uh, culture industry. Now, going straight, I think we saw in terms of the production zone, so we are not only restricted in Bindu. We have different satellite offices that are around the country where we resort for, for easy management and easy support in terms of the production zone of agronomic and agriculture activity. So this presentation will be more to highlight the details of statistics just for us to understand and see the trend. If you look at the first one, it's just to give a perspective of where are we coming from and where are we in terms of horticulture. 2011-2012, uh, uh, the local production of horticulture was almost around 30,000 metric tons and we are at 40,000 in 2021-2022 season. And then you can also look in terms of export. Uh, if I look in terms of the last 11 years, 2011-2012, uh, it was at around 22,000 uh, metric tons, and then we are at 59,000 metric tons as we speak. And in terms of import that comes into the country, uh, 11 years ago it was around 38,000 metric tons. It also grew up to 58,000 uh, metric tons. So in monetary value, I think which is also crucial for us to understand the value behind that, more or less the same similar trend as you can be able to see, to say uh, what has been produced local uh, uh, the last 11 years. 2011-2012, uh, it was, I think, uh, up to the value of around 95 million. As we speak, that has grown up, up to around 343 million. Now, in terms of export, similarly, uh, at the time, 2011-2012, uh, um, uh, just giving that as an example, it was around 458 million. And as, as, as we speak, 2021-2022, it, it reached a, a billion, one billion that we, in terms of the value of what we exported. In terms of what we imported into the country, 230 million, 2011-2012, and then 2021-2022 to 474 million. Now, just to break it down a bit, to make it more easier also to say, in terms of fruits and vegetable internet, you can able to see that we, are, we still need to do more in terms of fruits, uh, as only around 1,100 metric tons that are produced local, and then uh, import is still around 26,000 metric tons. And then when you look at the vegetables, I think we have done quite well on that. Where 39,000 metric tons has been locally produced versus what we are importing around 28,000. So, more or less the same as you look at the next graph in terms of the, the monetary values, as you can see on that. Now, it goes beyond that, it's more or less similar in terms of the market share, what we are we import local and export. Similar to the graph that I brought in, in terms of aggregating these uh, statistics. Now, if we move to the grains, 
This is more or less the same similar trend as I think as the executive director was talking about self sufficient. If you look in terms of 2010, 2011, uh, local production was around 40, uh, 47,000 metric tons. That's a combined, and this is more only on, the, on maize, white maize grain. And then as we speak, uh, for the first time in Namibia, we have produced what was marketed to be the highest up to 90,000. Uh, metric tons and uh, 2021 22, 112,000 metric tons. Local consumption in terms of the demand is around 200,000. And then in monetary value, uh, I think not only really monetary value, but when we move to wheat, more or less the same similar, we are uh, also struggling in terms of producing a lot of wheat, but we have seen a significant increase. Uh, compared to 2010, around 10,000 that was produced, but sometimes it, it keeps varying, we, it keeps dropping. But the, the highest ever we have produced so far was 20, 2021, 2022, uh, financial year in terms of uh, 18,000 metric tons of wheat. Imports 126,000, and then the total demand 144,000 metric tons. Now, on the pill rate, more or less the same. I think we have seen that uh, it keeps decreasing sometimes or increase. I think we know in terms of the, the drought impacts, it always affects because of the, the rent rate approach. But at least what is reported here is only what goes on the formal market. So we are not accounting for that what is produced and uh, consumed in terms of the household needs. This is more the price, domestic price on average of the different uh, grants. As you can see that I think it has been also increasing from uh, 2010. If we give an example of, of white maize, it was 2,600 uh, Namibian dollars per ton. I think uh, in 2021, 22 was 4,700. As we speak in the current marketing season, it's almost around 6,300 average price per ton for white maize. Now, that's just in terms of giving an overview of the domestic, uh, the total uh, uh, grain uh, lump together. Just to say, if we look at 2021, 2022, uh, our, our local in terms of production combined is 111,000 metric tons and versus the import of 239,000 metric tons. Now, in terms of the top, 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 top graded horticulture crops in Namibia, I think this does also to give the perspective of understanding the top imports, top exports, and top uh, local purchases. So we can able to see that in terms of import, which also present an opportunity for expansion if we are to reduce those imports, in terms of investment into uh, production. Potatoes is still topping on that. Uh, then in terms of what we can produce, we can look at potatoes, citrus, looking at the uh, uh, oranges, we can also produce bananas. At the moment, 100% of bananas is import. Then onions, uh, still sitting at around 27 million that we are importing. And then, and you can look at the to uh, tomatoes. I think some of you who were in the media and newspaper, you saw there was a bit of a mix in terms of statistics that was released. Uh, during the July months, as it was reported that we, I think there was that mix that we imported almost 24 million uh, worth of tomatoes, which is more or less the, the other way around. So we exported tomatoes to the value of 24 million. And what was only important was only the small cherry tomatoes that we can produce currently, which is almost less than 200,000 million dollars. So for export, I think we are also in terms of the top 10, it's uh, led by the temple crepes, the dates, we are still exporting onion, almost to the value of 24 million tomatoes, blueberries, uh, sweet melons, bananas, uh, peppers, and, and watermelon and potatoes. And then we have the local purchase, what was now produced local and consumed local. It's more or less to that. In terms of those values, it's significant. 
it signifies the, the, the opportunities and the benefit that we need to the local producers who were involved into those plans. Now, just to give it a little bit of extra explanation, also to say, as Namibian economic board within our mandate, which is very broad, as we are pas uh, tasked to facilitate the agronomic uh, industry and also production, processing, and storage, we have been implementing this through the market share promotion schemes. So, the way the market share promotion schemes works is that is what we are importing. I think we, we, we extended that also into special controlled crops. In terms of special controlled crops, we have 19 crops that we are monitoring daily and close the border. When, whenever we have sufficient expectation in terms of our production forecast, so we close the border to restrict import so that at least our local producers should be able to, to sell. So that applies to the grains. As we speak now in terms of the grains, we close the border from May, and, and it's still closed as we speak, and we are only expecting to open it around November when all the grains that are produced local have been sold out. We have another program that we have introduced from last year, which is ongoing. I think uh, having had a different outcry of small scale farmers not having access to the market, we introduced the program linking small scale farmers to the market. We are busy trying that in different production zones, but we would like to upscale it to include more farmers so that at least we can able to say we advise what needs to be produced, but at the same time we link it to, to the market so that there's already uh, off takers or agreements in place that needs to be signed off so that there's no uh, shortage of access to, to the market. Uh, I think earlier on there was also a talk in terms of uh, seeds or local seeds uh, access to that. From the Namibian Agronomic Board, we, uh, we had a memorandum of agreement with Southern India in the rest of Namibia just for us to avail funds to start conducting research. And this research is not going to end there, but we would like to, to be producing local seeds that are affordable that can be able to flourish within our, our environment. So we, we, we have started on that one. We have looked at the, the white maize, pure millet, and wheat as, as the first initial because of the staple food crops that we are depending on that. And then we, that has been followed with potatoes. We are busy with the French company, for, uh, which we are busy testing, the, making trials in terms of adaptation of certain uh, uh, potatoes varieties in Namibia. So that has been coming very good. Soon we'll be able to be publishing the outcome of that. And then we are already discussing with the rest of Namibia that uh, once we are coming to the end of this research, we need to lobby to get access to more land so that we can start producing these seeds to be available to, to farmers. The same similar one you can see on the middle, we have the, the, the crop, uh, this uh, crop budget is a guide or enterprise budget which we developed for small scale farmers at least to understand what are the production inputs that is required so that whatever produce you would like to get involved, you need to know the production cost, you need to know how much expected income are you going to, to get out of that so that you can be able to make a business decision if it makes sense. So we have developed that and that, that, that uh, crop budget enterprise is also available on our, our website. Now, to go further on that, we have the arm which we are regulating services. In terms of the trade facilitation, we conduct inspection services for water control, farms and inspection, farms and facility inspection. Uh, whatever comes in the country needs to meet certain requirements. Whatever goes out of export needs to be certified that it meets all the necessary marketing requirements and so on. As we conduct these uh, product uh, quality control and food safety inspection, then at the same time, uh, we, we have been busy doing capacity building for farmers, which NAB has been financing that, because we would like to introduce local gap and global gap to our farmers that whatever activities that is done in terms of production should be according to local gap or good agriculture practices that ensures quality, good safety, and so on. 
So we brought in this because we have seen that as we have been increasing local production, there has been a, a, a lot of issues on the market to say this product does not meet quality uh, uh, that we need on the market, that is not food secure in terms of the food, food safe aspect. So we took that as a next step from our side. As, as, we, as the topic talks on, on, on women in agriculture, I just brought the statistics also to say, out of what we have trained so far, 41% of that is women. We are busy analyzing in terms of development of crop-specific marketing standards, as I mentioned. This is, we are doing it together with the Namibia Standard Institute because any product that needs to be produced locally to meet certain standards so that it enables the such products to reach the market. There should be no uh, stumbling block or any rejection out of the market because it's produced according to standards. So far we have done almost 16 crops that we have uh, developed the standard and those standards are already gazetted and, uh, and, and, and available with MSI. We will be finalizing the technical regulation of those standards with the Ministry of Agriculture so that we can be able to enforce that. There's also incentive benefits. I think if, uh, if I'm also to mention that, that when you are producing for products for export, you are exempted from paying the levy because it's a part of incentive to encourage more export. Because what we should be concerned is not much looking in terms of what we are importing into the country, but what is it that we are exporting? As long as we can import small products, but what we are exporting should be more than what we are importing. And then I think that will give us kind of an advantage out of that. And that should be more focused on high value crops, so that at least we can be able to get a good price from the market. Well, with an nutrition security. Um, and that includes civil society and academia, and currently, in the absence of a business network for Namibia, it also includes the private sector. And in terms of the nature of our organization, I'd like you to just have a look at the logo on the bottom left of the screen, um, where you can see in the bottom part of the logo the food basket with diversity of food um, that's locally grown. But you see also in the middle and top part, um, and I'm not sure if everybody can see that, but there's a mother holding a baby and breastfeeding it, and a father uh, supporting the around. It. And that's basically the areas that we cover in terms of food and nutrition security. It's on the one hand about the food that is being produced, but it's also on the health aspects and the nutrition aspects. Um, and inspired by, by Dr. Mazi, I'd like to just share with you three statistics in that regard. Um, so the number one is that Namibia has a stunting rate for under five children of 24%. That is a quarter of Namibia's children that are stunted. And for those who are not familiar with the term stunted, like I've been some years ago, um, stunting really means that you are underdeveloped. You are not growing enough. And that's not just the physical height, that's the brain development, that's the intellectual capacity, emotional capacity, and so forth. So a quarter of our children is stunted. And that is, that is a real concern. The main key to address that is, is breastfeeding, supporting women, and having a healthy diet from the start. The second statistic is, what does stunting cost us in terms of the economy? And there's currently the cost of hunger study that's passing through cabinet, will be revealed soon. Uh, but I can say that the costs of just stunting or malnutrition, undernutrition alone, is 11 billion Namibian dollars, and that is 5.22% of our GDP. Um, and that's a lot, and that's not even covering the additional cost of overnutrition and all of these diseases that come from, uh, from overnutrition. And the third and last statistic um, is that comes from the filled nutrient gap, and that's another study coming through soon um, that says that a family of five. Uh, needs about $3,100 million per month just on food to meet the minimum nutrient requirements. And imagine spending $3,100 just on food alone for the average limit. Um, that's really something where we would like to come in as an alliance 
um, with the different members from civil society, academia, and the private sector to work towards not just producing enough food, but to look at the whole food system and making food also accessible. Um, looking at dietary changes or consumer habits. Um, and when the first movie was shown, I just looked at the citruses and the dates and the blueberries. And I started really wanting to, to consume some of those. But if we look at the typical American diet, it doesn't include as many vegetables as are being produced and shown. So, so this is also something we really, um, our role and our mandate is to not implement projects, but to have members from those different areas, civil society, academic and private sector, to get those members informed, involved, coordinated, and to advocate for changes around the whole food system. So let me stop there, and just that's kind of our mandate, but to also provide resources and information. Um, especially COVID, I think, was um, a tragedy, but was also a great opportunity for us to learn that we need to produce more food and we also need to eat more healthy. So these are the situations where we, for instance, use the existing food guidelines to produce some information on COVID and food uh, safety and nutrition and translate that into 11 different languages and, and share that information just to give an example of the work we do. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, and also, you know, we uh, put this in the time, so um, there's a few more questions I would like to cover, but I think I'll also just ask the panelists to come up uh, keep it somewhat brief. But yeah, but thank you very much. Very informative indeed. And, you know, we know in the movie as much as we know uh, that 70% uh, of our, uh, our labor force employees is employed in agriculture. Only about about what four to five percent of uh, of our GDP is actually comes from the agriculture uh, you know, sector industry. So that's quite a huge disparity. And now we have uh, you know this a great big war in, in Ukraine uh, with regards to producing more food to become more food secure. Maybe first I'll, I'll, I'll put it to Dr. Mazi in terms of what is the market doing right now to make sure it's more food secure that and so that we are able to feed our own population given um, you know um, uh, you know our arid uh, you know environment. Uh, th thank you very much. I think I think from from, from the perspective of food, Namibia is a country I, I think to start with as I indicated earlier to say in terms of the trend for food life sufficiency, we have done quite well. I think uh, the challenge is that uh, we could have done more if we could have operationalized all our food schemes and our food strategy at this juncture. But I think the discussion is ongoing in terms of trying to see how, how can we uh, be able to operate in these green schemes as effectively. But, but I think from a, a broader perspective, I would link it to say uh, the war in, in, in Ukraine, Russia, all that is ongoing so far. Also presented as a value of an intention of community that we need to take advantage because we need to invest into food production and, and, and we need also to invest in terms of uh, across the value chain looking at the fertilizer opportunities because currently all our fertilizer opportunities are imports. I think we, this is something that we need to, to discuss and, and look unpack it and, 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 and let's start uh, motivating for investment in that. And then the, the other option is that just to also give a bit of uh, easy in terms of understanding our, 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 our local needs of, of, of the, the brands. The expectation currently uh, of, of white based brand is 110,000 at this time that we are expecting this market to see, which will be the highest ever from 90,000 that I mentioned earlier. And that is already at least giving us some hope and that. We can be able to do that on, on our own. We need to take advantage of, 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 the, of the, the utilization of our resources, of the land that we have. I think we have quite good land with, with, with good soil that is able to sustain the operation. But we need to start upscaling some of these initiatives, especially looking at the Mekata Bank, which is also the current holding sufficient water that we can use, utilize. To Output crops for export. And then we are also facilitating, as I indicated, in terms of research, because we cannot not be able to address food self sufficiency. We are still depending much on imports of, of, of grains, 
or seeds that we need to, to look at. I think that's the basic, the, ba the basics or the basis of, of the value chain and then we need to, to start uh, upscaling the opportunities. Now, we have programs that we have aligned in terms of engaging, uh, facilitating engaging farmers that we need to be present in terms of producing according to good agriculture practices because that's the basis also in terms of ensuring food safety, ensuring that anything that is done is according to its own uh, standard. But the drive from the Libyan Agronomic Board, which we, which we need to understand is that uh, we, we, have, we have, over the last six months, we have also been calling to say, uh, in terms of the topic of Namibia's best for a green economy. Now, within the green economy, it will ensure us and face the issues of environmental sustainability, the social uh, uh, acceptable aspect of, to say, what would be the role of women if we are to implement the green economy aspect. We need to enable the environment by, by at least coming up with policies that are conducive, financial packages that are sustainable, and unlocking and, and this uh, 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 kind of uh, holding up uh, factors uh, in terms of collateral. I think aligning it to what the uh, agribank has introduced in the past years in terms of uh, loan targeted for youth and women. But we need to go further than that because. We need to come up with financial package that is sustainable. It will not make sense for us to give someone a loan of 100,000 to go produce potatoes, but at the back of the mind, we know to produce potatoes, we need 200,000. So that means that financial package should be inclusive across the value chain from production to the market, so that the farmer at least can be able to, to live within that and sustain the production. The economic aspect of Touching the same topic, and also, um, I think um, all the other panels have touched on it in terms of how um, basically, you know, women can, can, can really play a part in terms of improving the food security of the Mobile. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to just highlight um, the three different membership groups uh, and, and the role that they are playing, starting with civil society. So, our role as the alliance is to really connect um, civil society and give them a voice and strengthen civil society's role, and there are amazing organizations um, out there who often don't work on a larger scale, but who work with communities on a smaller scale. And I just want to give an example that we, a project we initiated or worked in collaboration with the Shack Dwellers during COVID, um, and that tackled um, individual, individuals living in informal settlements um, around how to be organic permaculture, uh, set up an organic permaculture garden around your home, not necessarily ensure that you can feed the whole family, but that you add to the food and that you really can transform over the period of one or two years the dry soil that can have been took with composting and other permaculture methods into quite fertile land with very simple methods and means. And by, and by focusing really on a lot of people on a large scale, if everybody does a little bit, then we also, not necessarily commercially, although some people who produce a lot were actually selling them the spinach to a local vendor, but you can actually um, do a lot around food security if you focus um, through NGOs um, to a um, massive amount of people, especially those living in informal settlements. Um, so that's civil society, academic. I like what Dr. Moise said about the fertilizer issues. Um, one of our members, NAST, um, has a great uh, Dr. Dr. Percy who's doing some research around microbes um, as fertilizers in the soil, and they have proven to be more effective even than chemical fertilizers. And that will be a very organic, local solution to fertilizing um, soil. So our role is then to really make those research more accessible, more known, and to see how one can create the connection network between different institutions working as um, and lastly, private sector, that is still an area we can still have to engage, but there's a lot of potential in and around the private sector. And in all of our um, projects so far, the role of women has been higher than that of the men in terms of activities. Um, and we haven't really 
quotas or anything specifically in place for supporting women initiatives, but based on our experience in the short period of time, it was mainly predominantly women who were active and forthcoming and very um, taking a lot of ownership in the project um, so far. And coming back to the link between agriculture and nutrition and health, um, what also was mentioned in the clip from USAID is really the link between strengthening women and ensuring that there's not just production, but there is a nourishing taking place um, that really makes a difference for us in society on the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think my closing remarks will be to say, I, I think in terms of agriculture, uh, if we are to be successful and sustainable, it's more within the context of organized agriculture. Because uh, in this organized agriculture, we would need uh, an engineer, we would need uh, an agriculture expert in terms of soil scientist, agronomist, and so on, to be part of this, the financier, and all that. But then, then if we are looking in, in terms of extending it to say, what role would we do to assist that women to flourish within agriculture? I think it's still within that context as I mentioned that's a hard one. Because we need to have an ecosystem based approach uh, in terms of uh, facilitating these agricultural activities. Why am I using ecosystem based? Is because if we are to start developing up in terms of rural development, it's only agriculture which has the backbone and, and, and uh, to say that we are winning in terms of economic development or we are not winning. It can only be through agriculture. Now for us to be able to enable the environment for women to, to play a critical role in terms of uh, food production, we need to enable the environment where they are, in the space where they are operating. One, we need to, to make sure that when we are setting up all these rural uh, agriculture activities. We need to enable in terms of road infrastructure, clinic services, schools, because uh, I think I, I was raised by a mother that the first thing that my mother wanted to know and understand is that I need to have access to education. So to avoid migrating of coming to town, we need to develop the rural area within that kind of an ecosystem. The recreation facilities because if I am farming, I would like to have my kids to have the same equal access to sports, all these activities that are in town, to be also available where the setup of agriculture activities. And for me, that's organized agriculture within an ecosystem approach. If we are to be flourishing within sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shanik, um, I think I want to use the minute not to give one particular answer but to rather say that women have been playing a huge role in agriculture, in families, in the whole food system um, approach, from production to really nourishing and so forth. I think where we are as a, as a society is that we're not valuing that role and supporting that role and recognizing that role. So it's less of an answer, but more of what other steps do we need to take to to, to value that role more, what work with men do we need to, to, to do, for instance, also around um, as a father providing a nourishing environment, a supportive environment, um, as a as a fellow farmer or as a yeah as a man in society, how we approach women uh, in so many ways. So it's it's a lot of a, it's a continued discussion. I think that's what I want to summarize. Where I wouldn't want to give one particular answer, but to say. That is part of our role as an alliance, as a network, to create platforms around dialogue to move these issues further. And there is a power in not just focusing on either uh, government, civil society, private sector, academia, but to really work across sectors and to work across the fields like agriculture and health and so forth. So for me, the one answer is to, to look for answers through this multi-sector engagement.